Being a member of the competition jury requires one to think very hard about the criteria that one will use to judge pianists. What is one looking for? What, it was, what does one expect from pianists? Uh, first of all, I think it's important to look at the criteria that are established by the competition itself to the extent that they exist, because it's obviously important to some extent to have a common set of guidelines that all members of the jury will be looking for. But alongside that, I think the most important thing that one might seek is some sort of understanding, a deep understanding, a kind of deeply embedded knowledge of the music that comes from within, which uh, holds up to close scrutiny on the part of listeners in terms of what one might expect as a listener, but which also communicates something special, special in terms of the understanding that comes from within the music itself. My education has taken two somewhat parallel strands. Um, I, of course, had an academic education, going from an undergraduate degree at Princeton through a master's degree and eventually a doctorate at Cambridge, here in Cambridge. And um, that, of course, has developed into a, a scholarly career in which Chopin has been the main focus of much of my musicological research. But parallel to that um, is the work that I've done since I was very, very young, age three or four, as a pianist, also with um, education at the Guildhall School of Music along the way. And what I've tried to do in my work and indeed in my, my life as a musician is to bring those two things together so that in a sense they're one and the same thing. So that there's a kind of seamless connection between, if you like, the intellectual understanding that scholarship may foster and help one develop and the kind of deep artistic understanding that one needs as a musician. So some of the ways in which that kind of fusion has been manifested would be, say, in some of my work on performance studies, analysis in performance, where one writes about music from an analytical standpoint, but with the music right at the heart of the study rather than sets of properties that are found in the score. In other words, music, we have to remember, is something that happens in sound and across time. And so as a scholar, I've tried to understand and to study music with those properties right at the heart of the work that I'm doing. I myself see no necessary contradiction between a scholarly self and a musical self. And as I say, I have always sought for there to be one and uh, one unified approach. Um, so as a member of the jury of this competition, uh, I see no potential contradictions again between those two halves. One will definitely inform the other. And I think here it's interesting to consider cases, and one could name some cases, where pianists may not do precisely what the scores have indicated or precisely what I myself believe Chopin intended. That will certainly happen in this competition, just as it happens in performances of, of all kinds. Does that necessarily mean that the performances are wrong or bad or whatever? And I would say no. That doesn't mean that they have necessarily honored all aspects of the intentions and the sources as we approach and interpret them. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are to be dismissed in their own right. And I think one of the things that a scholarly approach has helped me to develop over the years is ways of understanding other people's performances in their own terms. What is a pianist doing? What is he or she trying to, to get across? What have they found in the music? Which may be something that I have never found for myself. That can be very refreshing and invigorating. I may disagree with some aspects of their performance, but nevertheless regard it as a brilliant conception. It may not be something that I would have done or that I would have wanted them to do necessarily, but that doesn't mean it's not in its own way a brilliant conception. It can also be not such a brilliant conception. You don't have to agree with what everybody's doing, of course. Um, here, objective criteria gets you only so far. Um, you, you have to fall back on your, your instincts to, to a large extent, um, but also utilize objective criteria where they exist and where they are applicable. The Chopin competition is, of course, a special event in the, the pianist calendar, if you like. Uh, the focus on Chopin is, of course, itself a, a big factor in that. Um, how many composers 
have there been who really, really understood the piano? Um, one of them, of course, and probably the preeminent one is, is Chopin. So if we're talking about a piano competition and we're talking about Chopin, we have the potential to, to hear music for the instrument that is uh, really deeply conceived and understood for that instrument um, in a way that may not be true of other composers to the same extent. So that automatically sets it apart from certain other competitions where a range of composers would be, would be heard. But I think there's also a kind of prestige that's attached to it. And um, of course, many other competitions also are prestigious, Tchaikovsky, Rubinstein, and so forth, um, absolutely. But I think the, the Chopin one has a particular place in the world's imagination, in the world's uh, pecking order. And um, I think the fact that it, it happens every five years is something that, that people look forward to and, and thrive upon. Um, it's an immensely exciting occasion. I think one of the most difficult aspects of being a member of the jury is stamina, focus, concentration, remembering what one has heard some time before. Um, there have been studies done uh, as to the importance of the order of contestants in competitions, a very, study, a very famous study done in, in Poland um, itself about um, 30 or 40 years ago, I believe, um, where um, pretend jurors, if you like, in this experiment were played recordings of musicians, and two of the recordings were identical, but in different places in the series of recordings that they heard, and, and quite different scores were given because of the contextual implications. So I think to be able to apply consistent criteria across the board with the focused concentration that is required is, of course, a challenge. To be able to remove from the consideration one's personal preferences is not to say one suspends all judgment coming from one's own background, but to, to avoid personal bias and so forth, I think is always a challenge for members of the jury, which is why we need the blend of objective and subjective criteria working together. It's interesting to consider the degree to which Chopin still speaks to us today. Uh, one could say, well, he died in 1849. It's um, early to mid 19th century music and it's, it's part of history. But I think partly because he himself avoided the kind of specific um, titles and emotional um, associations of, say, some of the music of Liszt or other contemporaries, um, it remains timeless. I, I think of it as timeless, as, as having no fixed uh, chronological position um, which is absolute. In other words, um, I think one of the reasons why Chopin remains such a popular composer, um, and as we will hear in the competition, a, a composer that invites um, ever new interpretations is because of this, uh, this very rich potential and possibility within the music, which means that it's not tied to a given time, it's, it's open to all of us to, to feel, interpret, and to make our own as we wish. And that's a very special property. One can think of other composers where it's simply not the case. It's not to say that that music is dead and needs to be looked at as a kind of artifact in a museum. But Chopin is, is alive today. One of the comments made in response to um, one of my online projects, people put a blog trail, somebody said, Chopin lives. And that's the way I like to think of it myself. <laughs> 